Hello everybody and welcome back to the Property Sourcing Network pop-up podcast. We're in sunny Canvas Lang today. David and I have got our shorts on um, and we've got another episode <laughs> lined up. <laughs> so, David Boy, tell us what's been happening since the last, last podcast, which was like six days ago. Aye, well, that's just a week ago, wasn't it? So, uh, really no much, to be honest. The beer house, one in Glasgow, uh, Ballonock, that I was doing, that I bought, I put it on the market with my, my own agency. So before kind of official launch, um, we just stuck it on just to kind of see the process from start to finish. I'm one of the guys that kind of likes to see how it's all done and then pass it to... Have you got some You've got Zoopla and all that? Right, moving Zoopla. Right, aye. did you get on the market? No, go on the market. You get it free for six months. Do you? Aye. Is that the deal I, you got, aye? My, my six months is just about finished. Right, so remember? The 199 plus VAT. Do you get in through it though? It's, 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 you, if you have having Zoopla, you as well have on the market, you can really? you know what I mean? If you may as well just have all three for the sake of 200 quid. Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's worth I it. Get like, on it. Nah, <laughs> it's worth it. But um, sorry, mate, I just interrupted you. No, it's, it's fine. Um, so I, that, that, I was doing viewings for that yesterday. I've got quite a lot of interest. Um, so expecting a few offers on that. I've so, already yeah. got a couple, so uh, that'll be good just to get that one gone, hopefully in the next four weeks, four or five weeks or something. Um, sold one rent to SA yesterday, uh, and we've actually sold a six rent to SA portfolio yesterday as well, which is a nice fifteen k all in fee. Wow! Um, but the investors asked us for a week. He's paid half the fee, and he's asked us for a week to do further due diligence on them, which I'm more than Fair happy enough. to give him. Do you know uh, what I mean? Definitely, because you know how some of the rent TSAs are. The thing with rent TSA, and you know us more than anybody, um, it's so hard to do comparables for. It's so hard to get, you know, yeah. it's like nobody a BRR, there's the end value, there's the for It's like they can be, they get, you're taking basically an average of different properties in different months and you're looking at PM, property market intel data, Airbnb data, stuff like that, but it's, that's that's excluding direct bookings as well, a lot of that stuff, so yeah. it's very skewed a lot of the numbers. And so it's quite often when you're looking at them, if you're looking at, say, July's figures, if that, any ones that are available in July, if, um, if they're not booked, they'll automatically have the prices higher, and then as it gets closer to the date, they'll drop the exactly. price. So you can exactly. think, oh, I'm going to get £180 a month next month, but then by the time it comes to July, maybe they're only charging 120 or 100%. something. 100%. It's, so it's, it's so difficult. hard. It's so hard to do. That's how, like, just with rent says we do sell a few, um, but we're always like, you listen, this is our numbers. We've done all our research. This is the research we've done, but by all means, do your own. Um, I think it's quite important because... Yeah, they can. Sometimes we've had some clients have worked out a lot better than what we've, yeah. we've anticipated, you know, so it's just It's more of, of a risk, risky strategy, really, yeah. is it? It's like acquisition, isn't it? So Aye. it's one of the ones, isn't it? But Good. So, <clears throat> yeah, that was good. We had one deal fall through last week. We were talking about this in the network, the, the Gazumpin incident. So, um, as far as I was aware, Gazumpin in Scotland was basically illegal. So, what's happened is my clients had an offering in a property for weeks now um, he's using bridging so he's been speaking to the lender and everything yeah the broker get everything sorted for his lending sorry so um, that all takes a bit of time and just the other day the emails came through just saying that um, the, the seller is withdrawn because they've had a higher offer and they're going to accept a higher offer now to me that's just pure clearly gazumping I think there was a bit of a, a grey area in that, you know, because something is only if, if the missives are concluded, which I, I, I phoned Karen about this and she says, no, no, it's if the offer's in and accepted. Yeah. However, what will happen then is the seller, the seller solicitor shouldn't actually be acting for the seller if she's going to play the tricks. So, so the, the solicitor should remove herself for the, for the acting for her. Right. And that's pretty much it. Be interesting now, to see how they got the other offer, though. No, I know, you know I know. I mean? but, but, but see, for me then, like, Gazumpin is 100% allowed in I, Scotland. No, because, definitely like, is. All you do then is, like, say I, say I put an offer in on... Say I accept an offer on a property from you, and then Cameron puts an offer in tomorrow higher. Yeah. And I just go like that, listen, I'm going to take Cameron's, but I'll no use your that solicitor I'm going to use, I'll just get another solicitor and use it for Cam. You know? I, I've had it before with the estate agency, like I was saying, like somebody's put an offer in, but it wasn't formally accepted yet. 
and then in the time period before it was formally accepted, someone else has came in with a much higher offer. Yeah. So it's obviously a no-brainer which one the seller's yeah. going to take, yeah, yeah, but yeah. the difference was that offer wasn't, wasn't formally accepted. accepted exactly. Yet. So this, the solicitor just um, took that. Calm C- basically just says, look, it's something I would never get involved with. No solicitor really should get involved with it. It's dirty tactics really as well, you know, but at the end of the day, like, what the fuck can you do? I know, that's it, mate. That's it's, it. it's that. So that's pretty much been it for, for the week. And obviously, just chipping away at the, the the expansion and stuff, which is pretty close now. The website's pretty much done and stuff. So Brilliant. it's all going alright, mate. But you? So I've had a really good week. Um, as I said in the network, so my my flip, the last podcast, I wasn't sure if the flip was going to go through in Kirk Liston that we sold. And uh, the lawyer said basically we've got till twenty to five on Friday. Otherwise, it's going to be Tuesday or Wednesday because it was bank holiday Monday. And I get a call at 33 minutes past four saying that's it done on Friday afternoon. So I was absolutely delighted. Oh, um, so that went through. We got we got paid up for that this week. I've had two sourcing deals complete as well for clients, both in the borders. And then we sold uh, an estate agency listing, which went through on Wednesday as well. So that takes me to eight completions for the month, oh. um, which I'm quite pleased about. Two new project management agreed uh, jobs, which are obviously one of them is a deal we sourced. One of them is actually a referral from someone else. Um, and obviously I've just this morning gone and seen that flat that we agreed in Shawlands so we've got the architect um, on the case now to get some plans and stuff drawn up for that one to do bid yeah Yeah. Ian so he went out last week I think but I wanted to get my Kirk Liston one over the line before we went into to that so we've paid him up so he's drawn the plan so it should be good so it's a one to two bed conversion in Shawlands mm-hmm. so looking forward to it and um, it's something that I've never done before building warrants and architect yeah, yeah. stuff so I'm looking forward to getting stuck into that so been a really good week mate to be honest yeah and I'm now spending my Saturday with you guys <laughs> again <laughs> no, it's, uh, like, it seems like it's been a good month you, you, you seem to Something I never do at the end of a month is like look at like well, what's what's been the income in my business you know, and stuff like that. I don't, I don't really that's because mad. there's expe- there's so much expended expenditure as Aye. well. So I really just look at my profit margin. Yeah, do you know what I mean. But you, like I, I, I just I, I look at my bank statement at the end of the month and just talk, tally up all the money in, and then it's so just on a notepad like that. I didn't mm. use any system or nothing like that. What's came in and then the figure, and then what's came out, and then see what's left, and just yeah. log it on a spreadsheet with how many completions I've had this month and everything like that, yeah, just yeah, to yeah. keep it nice and tidy. Because I tried using like QuickBooks and stuff like that, but see if you're not an accountant, it's fucking solid to use. Right, You've got right. to put in all the codes for I the just expenses. Use spreadsheets for all ah, that stuff. I hundred percent, man, hundred percent. So paid my tax bill this week as well. Um, so that's, that's something. Ah, you know, class. <laughs> and then uh, myself and Mark Riley, I think I maybe touched on this last week, but we had a deal full confirmed that it was going out of bed yesterday. Um, fell out of bed so that was because it was built directly yeah. slap bang on top of a mine shaft um, so the client just says too much risk and um, the solicitor's not advising him to buy it so see, see that I think that is solicitors annoy me when they, when they start advising you not to do something I yeah. know they need to act in your best interest but w- w- she even took into consideration what is the risk factor and everything else because it's not just going to sink into the mine one day. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's just not going to happen. Similarly, really. the chances of any movement in that's very, very slim. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's for saleability aspect of it. And then also, seemingly, he spoke to his broker. And his broker said that the bridging he'd got on it probably wouldn't be valid. So he'd have to go back and tell the bridging lender. Right. So that was... It makes sense. I was, we were expecting no, no, it anyway. But, but why, why, there's plenty of opportunities out there. Why would you bother risking it if you didn't have to? Do you know what yeah. I mean? That one, uh, did I actually say last week that I, I completed the one in Johnson? No, you, you mentioned it, but you didn't touch on numbers. So that's probably something that's happened. Yeah, that week. <laughs> and actually, I completed on the, the one bed in Johnson, so I could, I could probably talk a wee, a wee bit about that. But basically, the reason that came into my head there is because that's on a mine shaft yeah, as well. Yeah. But I get that at such a good price. So, um, long story short, with that one is somebody approached me through my leads. Sorry, through my some, somehow they approached me through my lead forum. I wasn't actually running any ads at that time, and uh, he was basically just saying, "Look, we really need this gone. It's a massive burden on the family. My brother died in the property, um, so I kind of down tools, went out to do viewing right away, and agreed a really good deal. But they were, you know, he's already fo- phoned me up and kind of thanked me and stuff. Like that, which has been brilliant. So I bought it for ten grand. <laughs> Um, <laughs> the surveyors said verbally when I showed them photos and stuff that it's worth about 35 to 40 if it's worth 40 it's a 75% discount brilliant and uh, 
the reefer bonnet, you probably are touching still 20k, yeah. I would say, even though it's a small one bed. Aye, aye, aye. Um, but even at that... Well, how many big square meters is you know? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't even, it's not even got an APC. No? No, I just, I just bought it without an APC and everything, because I was getting it such a good deal, I didn't want to kind of rock the boat with anything. Yeah, I um, And, yeah, basically it'll be worth 60, 65 at the end, so the exits are trade right on, flip, or BRR. What are you thinking? Most everybody, I put a wee poll out on social media the other day, and everyone saying you'd be crazy and uh, do be a rap. Yeah, I was thinking about that the other day right after yeah. I was slating it. I was thinking if I was you, for the sake of 10 grand, you may as well take a spin. But I, I was really surprised when you hit maybe the broker stats because usually if something's under 75k mm -hmm. and it's non standard, I thought you'd be 7 8% for that. Yeah, yeah, so it's one of the ones, by the way, like I could be. But they're just saying on the face, say, oh, you know, you, you may, may, it might be one of the ones get you in the door type thing. You know? I, I, I think it know. has to be that, mate, because I don't know. yeah, I've had clients that was valued under seventy five in just mm -hmm. a standard construction, and it was way higher than that. Yeah. So I, I don't really understand how that works, especially but if it's I'm so, Do you know what? I'm so torn with it. Yeah. I'm so torn because I'm getting a lot of money out, all money out, plus I'm I'm getting a healthy profit. Why don't you, Why don't you try and sell it for a month, and if you didn't get an offer that you want to take, then just build it up. Yeah. I wouldn't flip yeah. it, but no, you could no. just sell it or just refur refurb and refinance it if you that's, don't get the yeah, offer that you that, need, <coughs> because it gives you another right. listing on the agency as well. I know, I know, that's it. So aye, that's, that's a, that was a major result, another good trade deal, it was going to be a trade deal now, I don't know what it's going to be, <laughs> but another good deal nonetheless, so um, I just saw it jump back there, but no, that yeah, sense. that's that's the return on mine shaft as well, so what happens to that saleability for just even a, if a residential buyer was to come yeah. in or something like that, I don't know, yeah. what happens to the lending, you know, like you say, if, I, if it's on a mine shaft and I go to refinance it, does that have an effect on lending and yeah. stuff, you know, so all these wee things I want to that's figure it. out. You're never going to lose money though. Do no, you know what I mean, if you're no, in for 10 bags. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Can I buy a lawnmower for that? <laughs> so, the day um, this podcast, we're going to talk about finding investors, really, and that's why we're in my, one of Matt's projects for one of both of our investors, actually. So, the guy's actually bought a deal through me, and we are currently managing it. We're getting all set up for management the now. He's bought this one. You can tell a bit of the story about that, Matt. But yeah, we just thought, you know, come to this one. It's another one that's completed. Get easy. You can have a wee look if you're watching on YouTube, see the photo and the end product and stuff like that. And this is just a really good sort of case study for working with investors, how we found and how Matt found this investor as well. Um, and just the kind of ins and outs about working with investors. So crack on, Matt. Um, where are we today and a bit of background on it? Yeah, so we're in Croft Road in Canvas Lang. So this is a two bed flat. Um, it could kind of be classed as a three bed yeah. upper flat, sandstone building, really, really nice property. Um, it was bought, brought to myself by Mark Riley in the group, um, who we've mentioned <laughs> probably on every, time, e every podcast we've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> but Mark and I, who's, who's a good member of the Property Sourcing Network community, we've done five deals since December or something like that, co-sources. Um, so he's brought the deal and I've paired it up with one of my clients. Um, I've always got a surplus of clients, so it's great to have different avenues to get deals in the door, as you know. So Mark found this one through a, a letting agent. Um, that I think approached him on LinkedIn, which is something we'll talk about later in the podcast. So I think Mark obviously had been posting organically on LinkedIn. This letting agent had, had uh, reached out to him. He viewed it. We agreed a price. And then I think the letting agent um, took somebody else to come out and see it. So we managed to get, you know, my client was happy to pay a little bit more money to secure it. So mm -hmm. he paid um, 112, I think, for it. And obviously your guys through your home improvements company came in and done the refurbishment. Yeah. Originally it was going to be a BRR. So he bought it, he spent the money on the refurb, he was going to refinance out and then rent it, I think. We would be looking at about a grand a month, I yeah. think, something like that for rental, which is pretty good. But actually it's a really good area for sales and there's lots of good sold comparables and I think you'd actually sourced this client who we'll touch on in a wee minute another property and he said the return that he was getting on that one would be a lot better for the money in than this yeah. one so what he subsequently decided to do is flip it um, so I've got this marketed for sale on right move and whatnot through my state agency at the moment so it's a really good PSN deal isn't it like Mark brought it to me <laughs> 
I sold it to one of my clients. Your guys done the refurbishment <laughs> on it, and then it came back to me for selling. But it was going to go to you for rental, ah. so it's like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's a complete end to end. So ah, yeah. that's the kind of story with this one. We've got 185 grand home report. It's been on the market for a couple of weeks. The only slightly disappointing thing is I wish we'd known it was going to be a flip before we'd yeah, done the yeah. work because you can see the standard of finishing here is really good. Kitchen, bathroom flooring, paint, but probably we'd have done it a little bit differently yeah. if we knew we were going to sell this in terms of colour scheme yeah, and stuff yeah, yeah. like that. So that's the only thing. But it's been on the market a couple of weeks. We've had a good level of interest. No offers as yet, but um, we're going to revisit the price next week and see what we can do on that. So this particular client is a, a client of mine and a client of yours, which mm -hmm. we've got a couple like that now, don't we? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. That we've got in common, because obviously you're based in the West and I'm based in the East, so people inevitably reach they out to both to of us. They want to diversify a little bit, don't they? Exactly. Exactly. So um, this client's based in Hong Kong. Um, uh, he's a really good, good guy. Came over at Christmas time yeah, to meet us yeah. both, didn't he? He's a really nice guy. I, I believe he's an investment banker. I'm sure yeah, he is. I think that rings a bell, he's yeah. an investment mm -hmm. banker from Hong Kong. Obviously, he was telling me you can't really buy a property in Hong Kong for less than like 300 grand. Yeah. And the yield is just not there. So he bought a couple of properties down in England, I believe. And now he's ventured into Scotland working with myself and you. So we were actually speaking about how, how we got this investor when we came on the cop before we came on the, the podcast. But I think from memory, I feel like he might have posted in a Facebook group and someone tagged us both, but yeah. I can't actually really remember how we ended up getting in touch. I, I remember being on, um, being on a Zoom call with him and, uh, you know, just I don't know how again, but I was... I was trying to kind of funnel him into my, my VIP thing. It was just at the time where that was, that was happening. And um, it's one of the ones where I, I've, I've had quite a lot of overseas investors over the years, I started with a bunch of overseas investors, and that's what really got me kick-started. And uh, it was always dead exciting, that part of it, yeah. getting on calls and yeah. Zooms with overseas investors, yeah. and you think, oh, this is amazing. And, you know, fast forward a couple of years then, when we, when we first met Andy, um, and it was like, God, this is just another time waster. Is that what you thought? That, that's, what I, that's how my mindset shifts, has shifted so much in the time. You must feel that as well, like, at the start, and you, you see it as well, like, I've got a call with investor, and you're all excited, and you see other people... And now it's like, if I've got a call with an investor, I actually, pro I actually probably land a lot more investors now because I just know how to talk to them. I don't yeah. get this excited, like, kid in a sweetie shop where yeah. I think I'm going to get invested with a million pounds. It's just like, have a chat with them. What do they want? What can I offer them? Do you want to do business together type thing? Yeah, and that, that's totally. kind of my full... But I did think, you know, he was asking all these questions. I was on his Zoom call for ages and I was like, this guy's got to buy nothing off me, man, I know. <laughs> but it's just, I don't know if it's just... And so it, it always makes me laugh, like, because obviously I'm the same. I've sold a, a property in Saudi Arabia, to a client in Saudi Arabia. I've worked with clients in Oman, yeah, yeah. Uh, Dubai, um, Hong Kong, obviously, the Netherlands, um, lots from London. And it always makes me laugh sitting in a wee office in Gala Shields and I'm on, <laughs> I'm on a call with someone <laughs> in, do you know what I mean, the Middle East and stuff like that. It always makes you laugh, doesn't it? But I really like working with the overseas guys because I like the feeling of them having full trust in you. Yeah, um, and it just kind of makes you step up and provide that level of service and constant communication. I, I'm massive on communication with everything I do. I'm yeah. never off my phone. Um, so I really enjoy that that aspect that, of it. That's something I'm actually going to speak about just when we talk about a wee couple of case studies because that the overseas investors is why I decided to create my business model that I've done. Yeah. So I'll talk about a wee bit about that. Yeah, well. totally. So there should be a decent level of flip profit in this one for, for the so client. What, what, yeah, then, if it, if it does go for 185? Uh, I honestly can't remember top of my head, mate, including the fees, ADS, but I think from memory it was maybe touching 20, around right. about that level in terms of profit, which is pretty good. Um, so it's a really good area, this in canvas line. Do you know what I mean? There's a nice bowling green and that out to the back. Yeah, yeah. Had someone interested right away but they didn't like it because the garden was shared on the deeds unfortunately yeah. which you can't really it's help it's not parcel in these cottage flats though 100% so that's that's where we're at so I, ideally then it doesn't say like 185 it doesn't say like 175 there's no point in him flipping it and I get the light again yeah <laughs> <laughs> maybe <laughs> But um, you'll take a bit nasty. I know. I know. <laughs> That's it. So, the topic on, on finding investors then is such a big one. So, we've kind of spoken about a couple of different topics on the podcast. This one, in, in my opinion, which is a little bit controversial, is I think when you start in property, you're like, how am I going to find these people that want to work yeah. with me? I've not sold a deal. These people don't exist. These magical investors that have got millions of pounds to spend. But 
actually once you've been doing it a wee while, which we both have, you realise that finding the buyers for stuff is normally the easiest part, and it's the yeah. same with raising private investment as well. It's the easiest part. The hardest part is actually putting these people into good deals and yeah, providing yeah. A, a surplus amount of good quality deals. Yeah, I, I think for me, when I was first getting into property, an investor to I, I, I remember asking this question to so many people, like, how do I find investors? Like, sitting in my wee offshore cabin, like, thinking about, how do I even find investors? You know, I, I remember being on a webinar, when I was I was doing a free one with, I think it was Paul McFadden one, and I asked him in the, the text box, how do I find these investors? <laughs> and um, it's, it's mad, but, like, to me, back then, an investor was this, fat, you know, this guy in a, in a suit, he wore a suit every day and he had a briefcase and all that. That was an investor, yeah, yeah. he'd all this money, and you don't, re you don't realise until you start doing this a little bit that anybody could be walking by anybody and they're, they're an investor. Like, an investor doesn't need to, they don't necessarily need to have millions of pounds either do you know yeah. what I mean it's, there's investors everywhere there's money everywhere like you say the hardest part of this job is getting the investors deals totally so how, how do we find investors then David so I think just collating a wee sort of list that for, for me we've got LinkedIn is a, a really powerful one until you yeah. you get sort of kicked off I know I'm just um, back on it this you're week you're back on it and you, you both have, I think I'm up to about 15,000 connections on LinkedIn which I didn't even realise up until a few months ago you were I think you were running about the same yeah, until what, what happened to you but um, <laughs> that's, sounds like somebody died man. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, aye, that's fucking bizarre that you getting kicked off that but I uh, aye, LinkedIn's been quite a powerful probably not as powerful for me as it has been you do, do you know think. why I reckon that is right and uh, uh, this is kind of the same with finding deals and that as well but over my side of the planet there's not as many people doing what I'm doing yeah, 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 sure. whereas over your side of the planet because of various different reasons there's so many people Glasgow yeah. you know Canvas so Land all these kind of markets and people will just be sick and tired of it where if they see me in Edinburgh posting stuff I reckon probably that's why yeah if I was to guess yeah possibly um, but no LinkedIn is an absolute must just starting out in property if you're looking to do you know anything anything in property related whatever sort of route or strategy you're going to take whether it's sourcing or you just want to get a couple of deals yourself or whatever it is LinkedIn's really powerful because LinkedIn is the platform for businesses for jobs stuff like that it's a social media platform for that as everyone will know anyway and what, um, what kind of stuff would you be doing on LinkedIn then? so I just post for me my posting is different most places, to, to be honest now, I do kind of copy and paste a lot of my posts, but in the early days I was quite strategic yeah. in that we post more property related stuff, the deals I was doing, the losses, fall throughs, which is really important to be shown that as well yeah, on absolutely. social media, I think. It's not just about all the highs, because there is a lot of lows. Um, so showing stuff like that. Uh, even stuff about my family and, and everything like that, you know, just showing that you're a kind of genuine, personable yeah. person, and yeah. it's not just this like. Because oh, that's how that's how we met. Guy. That's how yeah. we met, isn't it? Aye, aye, exactly. So no, just no, just showing that you're, you, you know, you're acting like this big um, property sort of investor or sourcer, and you know, just 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 telling it as it is, basically, is the kind of route that. I wanted to go down on LinkedIn and it was it was really good. I've obviously built a lot of connections through it, through just like just the kind of honest approach is the, the approach yeah. I've always took on LinkedIn. I, I, I think you, you need to set your profile up right, first of all, mm. don't you? You have to tell people quickly what it is you actually do, yeah. where you're based, how you can help them in your profile and the he headline and things like that. And then for me, the success that I've had off it is just purely for posting deals. Like a couple of years ago, I deleted my personal Instagram and I didn't yeah. have social media at all. The only thing I had was Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, and that's what I use just to post business. But I've never been a big fan of just posting crap. I've never been a massive fan of social media in general, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I use Instagram a lot more now than I ever have just purely for work. But um, I always just post the deals that I do. And it doesn't make for particularly great viewing, like photos of a fucking shit house with yeah. what it's worth what we bought it for and stuff like that but at the end of the day that is the value that I'm bringing to people if that's the service they want sure. this, is, this is what I'm offering if you want to buy these property deals this is where I am so yeah. that's all I do is just and you're absolutely spot on you can just copy and paste for different platforms and stuff yeah, like that that's the thing as well see, see we linked in with the copy and paste sort of strategy now that I kind of tend to take is that LinkedIn you're going to get a lot more of your 
probably more serious investors on there. Yeah. People watching you that you don't realise are watching you in one day. Yeah, how many times have you had somebody Aye. say, I've been watching you for a while. And, and these people don't even like your stuff. They don't they comment, don't, they, don't they, like, don't, they don't view your profile. They don't. You don't even know they exist and then bang, straight one in your One day mailbox. they just see one yep. post that they like, you know, one deal that you've done and it's the biggest thing, see, see and everything we're going to talk about social media wise, it is just pure consistency. 100%. That's all it is. And it's even if you've not really done much that week, if you've done something, whether that's just been out doing a viewing or something like that, you know, just creating a post that week about uh-huh. it and LinkedIn. You don't really do stories on LinkedIn, don't you? Not? No, they, they posts, brought it in for a bit and they? then they took it back off. But I, I was looking at Barry Wilson's post on Facebook just on about consistency and he was talking about how these people come through property and they're everywhere Aye. and then they just fucking they disappear exactly. and do you know what I mean so it's, it's amazing to think about how many people that you and I have seen like that since we started they, they're sourcers or they're developers and they're doing this and they're doing that and then poof, yeah. you never hear from them again exactly. property sourcer investor developer SA marketing and then, genius uh, <laughs> and then it's like you, you take that post from LinkedIn you put it onto Facebook Aye. and it's a totally different avatar totally. so what, what your investor there could potentially be is your uncle Aye. your auntie you know somebody that knows somebody next door it, it, it tends to be that in Facebook I, yeah. in Facebook anytime I post something business related I get very little interaction very little likes anytime I post a picture of me and Sonny playing football or something you know 200 likes and stuff like that <laughs> yeah. you know it just kind of shows you I don't really post on, on Facebook much. Aye, not no. only my business page I don't really post on the, the personal one as often you know as I should nah no. I don't really know why I just do I, I'm mostly just personal and then I'll, I'll, I'll um, invite Kalar and I think that kind of ties into the next bit is social media isn't it yeah so that's it LinkedIn so is probably the main one in terms of investors that's where they tend to reside yeah. but make sure you're using that in terms of Instagram Facebook I mean look at Kieran in the group for TikTok he raised money off the back of that do you know what I mean so it's like you can be posting across all channels and like you say it's consistency in my opinion social media is the biggest one to find investors yeah, yeah, yeah. because it's your shop window these days isn't it do you know yeah. what I mean it's where people find out about you and then as you say if you're consistently posting across all platforms you're, you're getting the sort of best of both worlds exactly. you? you're touching on every kind of audience caliber I feel Instagram again is is a little bit different my Instagram is from from uh, LinkedIn, that, uh, LinkedIn and Facebook, it's more Instagram's my go-to. That's where Aye. I go to, and I make my posts first, yep. and then I'll I'll transfer it onto different platforms, and I'll maybe edit it slightly depending on yep. you know him trying to talk to and stuff like that. So you you search your audiences. Your audience probably will be different across all platforms, um, but I for me Instagram. Uh, LinkedIn, they're the sort of two big ones. Facebook, yeah, as, as I said, that is kind of more um, sort of family stuff and people and stuff like that. People like, but there is investors on every single platform. Totally. It's worth just having them all. A lot of people that come into the property and they're just they're not really that clued up with social media. Um, my advice would be get clued up. Yeah. Just there's no don't don't sit there and think oh it's too hard or this is shit I can't do it. Like it's an absolute necessity. If you want to be 100%. successful in, in property, I would say. hundred percent, mate. So the, the next point that I've got is networking, mm-hmm. which is obviously fairly uh, self-explanatory. But I always I do networking a little bit different, and I kind of always have. So I, I work with loads of guys that have been doing this a long time, and that's probably led to to certainly my my private investor that yeah. funds all my stuff. That's how that came about by meeting a landlord that's got they had over a hundred properties at one point. He introduced me to his friend, etc., etc. But I think you have to be trying to network with people that are so experienced and way at the top of their game that know everything as opposed to someone that's probably on the same level as you yeah, yeah. there's definitely a place for that but like I've never as you know um, I've never been a big fan of these kind of networking events and stuff like that that you get in the property space and, and the reason for that is one of the, 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 the guys that I work with that's been doing this like 25 years he, we went to one when the new SA licensing thing came and he says, to be honest, I've, I've never been a fan of this because everybody here is doing fuck all. Oh, yeah, They're yeah. not doing anything in property. Anybody <laughs> that's actually doing anything is too busy to go to these yeah, events because yeah. they need to spend time with their family and that in the evenings rather than go to this stuff. And it kind of always rung true to me and I was thinking, I've been to a few of these events now and nothing's ever came of it. And, and it's the worst thing in the world when you go to one of these events and someone's like, oh, I'm looking to buy a deal and someone shuffles <laughs> them in front of you and oh, here, Matt's a sorcerer, here, go and speak to Matt. And it's like, what are you looking for? 
for it. I'm looking for flips. Yeah, okay, perfect. Like, what's your email address? I'll add you to my mailing list. You know what I mean? That's what it's like. That's what it's like when we went to that last one. Oh, aye. But I think networking is key, and I've got a, a bit of a case study in, in the case study section after this, but you have to be networking in the right circles. You have to be going like business events that, that you know, you're paying for tickets at good sporting events, hospitality and stuff like that, and actually fucking speaking to people. Aye, aye. Um, but obviously property networking events have got their place for you at the start for 100%. Um, but I think if you want to get good quality investors and really propel yourself to the next level, you have to be surrounded. By, I mean, I've got loads of guys in my phone book that are like at the top of their game, like yeah. that I could probably phone most of them and they would just answer the phone straight away and I can ask them anything. Um, and that's just what takes you to the next level. But certainly you can find really good investors through that. And what actually has hap what happened to me is these guys that have been doing it a long time have got big portfolios inevitably they want to sell a couple use their capital so, gains allowance and you get a steady feed of deals over the course of the year yeah. through them um, so you can hit it both ways what I tend to find with the, the, the network events that you're talking about I think I've always took something away from them I've always quite enjoyed it it's always a bit of an effort going after you've had a hard day and then you need to go at night and that and then it's just a, pay, a bit of a pain in the arse but I always find I take something from them and the reason they've been good for me is because I kind of grew a reputation of you know the saucer type thing yeah. you know I was like probably one of the more well known saucers so people would talk to me and want and then next thing you know they'd maybe bring me a deal because they've seen my face and stuff so that was always good for me but not, not so much really in terms of getting investors I think the type of people you see in their rooms aren't the most ideal investors for us because 100%. they know the game, they know they want all money out, they know, yeah. you know, and it's as much as you would never say no to, to sort of investors, you know, sign them onto your mailing list or whatever, the chances of you, of you actually working with them and getting them deals is pretty yeah, slim. That's like it. you say, it's out at hospitality events, different networking events, events that aren't probably properly related. 100%. That's where you're going to meet your your good investors 100%. that maybe don't, haven't that got that strict a criteria. Yeah, you're absolutely. That's one of the big points that I've got is we don't want to be working with people that are looking for twenty five percent below market yeah. value, all money out deals because those deals don't come up that often. And when they do, you should be looking for them to do yourself, whether yeah. you're buying it to hold or whether you're selling on. Um, you have to be on board and investors, which we'll touch on in a minute, that are a good fit for you in terms of the personality type, but also you can realistically meet their criteria. Yeah, you know what I mean? So exactly. otherwise you're just wasting their time, you're wasting your own time and you're making yourself look a bit silly. Exactly. And, you know, we've seen it time and time again. I think I was guilty of it a way back at the start as well. Possibly you were, but these investors, you think, you know, you've got this call with the investor and you're dead excited yeah. and you, you think, you know, you go through the criteria and it is a strict criteria, but you maybe don't know yeah. that at the time or maybe you do know, but you think, oh, this is my first chance an investor, you, you end up well signing up, it yeah. used to take £1,500 off them up front. <laughs> um, it was like half the sourcing fee <laughs> and then instantly there's pressure on I you. Know. It's the pressure and then it's there, oh, have you got me a deal yet? Got me? No, I'm still looking and then you start to you start to lose faith and you start to doubt yourself and you can't get them a deal because it's a strict criteria. One one time, um, somebody two months into my, my sort of three months at Adam, um, asked for the money back, you know, and that was, I just says, listen, I'm happy and that was it. That was a change in my mindset in that I don't want to, I, I, I've just got, the way I've got set up is my, my, my free mailing list and then my VIP and then just my bespoke stuff that I've only got right now, two clients. You know, that's, that, that is it. I don't do the taking even £300 up up front or anything like that. I just, that, that's what I do because I, I work with um, such scale. But that was a, that wasn't a nice feeling that back then. Yeah. You know, it was like the pressure was on. I knew the pressure was on. I was trying my best every day, running about like a headless chicken. They eventually asked for our money back and I just thought I'm not doing it like yeah, this anymore. You know? Totally. No, that's interesting. Just before we touch on, on that and onboarding and the structure and stuff like that, one thing that's worked for me recently, and you'll, you'll seek the benefits of this in the coming months, is um, getting investors to right move. Right. So particularly yourself, if you're listing properties that are you know needing a bit of work or just lower value or whatever, you get a lot of people that are probably our ideal investor avatar. Mm -hmm. coming through right move um, so I've had a really good success off the back of that this year and also you know we both run sort of Facebook ads to build our mailing list don't we I just yeah. recently hit 5,000 um, if anybody's on my mailing list I can only apologise I don't send it I probably send about <laughs> a, a deal 
email a month at the moment because yeah. all, all my good deals just go straight to bespoke clients. Um, so that's the but Facebook ads has been good. I mean, you've had massive success yeah. with that, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. I the Facebook ads have been have been brilliant. Um, the way I've, I, I, th I feel like I've just struck a wee bit lucky with an ad, and it's just Aye. it's like if you get plenty of interaction on an ad the algorithm pushes it more and more and that's just what's happened to my ad you know loads yeah. of people saying oh this, this looks amazing how did I buy it how much what's the price that's a shithole blah 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 everything and it's just gained this traction where it, Facebook must just be keep putting out so yeah. right now it's sitting at 40 it was at 35 pence a lead and what I've done is I've actually asked for the phone number now as well on top of the right. name and the email it's bumped up to 40 percent a lead uh, 40 pence a lead sorry uh, that's so. really interesting I had a lot of success with one of mine as well I had loads of comments on it and then Cameron and I tried a video ad for the yeah. mailing list sign up and I went for 40, 50p a lead to £1.50 a lead Aye. which just goes to show you and do you know what else I've done recently I was probably about 70p a lead because I had a carousel I had two images, two ugly houses, and then after our call with uh, the Facebook ads mm -hmm. guy recently, I took the carousel off and just have one standalone image, and now I'm back down to 50p. Aye. So it just goes to show, if you're running Facebook ads to build your mailing list, one static what, what, image. One image, and th that's what we've sort of tried, because I've done the video and stuff like that, Aye. tried and tested different things, just it, stick it to work. Let, yeah. Learn for mistakes type things, stick to one What's ad, interesting one about the, the video ad, when, I, when we done it, and we had like a, somebody playing the bagpipes, and it was Scotland, property deals, and turned a nice house and a, an ugly house, and that was really good actually, but I got quite a lot of Instagram followers off the back of that, because obviously you're running them on both, but in terms of the leads, it was just a complete flop in terms yeah. of the cost cost per yeah. acquisition. So that's, that's um, is there any other ways you think people can find investors in? Yeah, so I've got one, um, and it's just the most basic having conversations with people. Yeah. It's so, so powerful how if you just, I tell you about uh, my first two deals. <laughs> <laughs> no, again, man. No. Um, if you just kind of have conversations with people and just like the kind of organic posting that you do on social media, on Facebook, Instagram and stuff like just looking to buy houses or whatever it is you're posting just organically that's free by the way obviously yeah. um, and having conversations when you're out and about because what will happen is you'll start posting organically the funnel seems to be you start posting organically people start watching what, looking at what you're doing they'll maybe start you know and you'll be scared because you'll think oh my mates are going to slag me and all that stuff like forget all that keep posting, keep posting, what will happen is you'll, you'll then end up going out with your mates or you'll go to a family party and your auntie, your uncle will ask what you're up to and then somebody else will ask and then, you know, you'll keep posting again. Next time they'll ask even more. Next time they might say, oh, I've got a bit of money sitting there. Yeah. Next, and you know, you know how it just kind of... It it's so interesting like that. that because, like you said, you expect them to be in a, in a suit driving like a oh. blacked out Mercedes with a briefcase, but so many people have got money and property is such a well-known wealth creation method yeah. now that everybody knows it's a good vehicle to go into and you just never know who's sitting with money in their bank that have been thinking about property most of yeah. my really good clients have came through and they've, they've obviously got money there they've got other businesses or whatever and they know property is what they should be doing but they just don't have the time and they just don't quite know how to break into it. Yeah. Which is, I think, kind of, have you got any more ways to find no, investors? It's, it's funny because you just kind of sparked something you said there, just in terms of right move, which I think could be really powerful. A lot about, you know, the structure and the model that I do, um, what at my viewing, at one of my viewings the other day, uh, for the beer house, two guys, a guy and a girl, sorry, a guy and a woman who had been following me for day one, Basically, he says, how are you doing? I've been following you, you know, we've talked for half an hour, and um, he says his brother has got a million pound there, um, he really wanted to do something with it, can I maybe put you in touch with him, do you know what, and it's just... You know what you should him. do, right? You should get, like, a plastic plaque made up, with a QR code on that's it. What saying, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do. Join our investor <laughs> mailing list, right? And put just screw it or tape it or whatever, nail it onto the door of every listing you've got. Aye. So when everybody goes through the door, they can see it and they can that's sign up. I was actually going to get could, just wee QR code cards made or something. Why don't you just get a banner like that and when you're doing viewings, just pop it up? No, it's no, too far, man. Nah, well, <laughs> nobody's going to fucking have a wee card. They'll use it to clean their teeth or something like that. You'll never be able to get to do that. No, to but that's, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Aye, no, but no, definitely. Just having the conversations just when you're in about even with friends family whoever it is it's you just don't know I keep success all the time you just don't know what that can 
lead to. So, yeah. um, the, the, the sort of qualifying for investors then, so that's what we're going to jump onto, was it? So I just wanted to touch on like Aye. what's our ideal investor, because we've said kind of what we're not looking for, Aye. but what, what are we actually looking for and what's the ideal client? Maybe what do they do for work? What's their life look like? Just paint a picture for the viewers. <sighs> It's a good question, actually. Something I've no, I've no, I've no thought about this. Obviously, pre podcast, but do you know sometimes I ask you questions and I'm like, fuck, I wish he asked me that because I already know the answer. That's why I'm asking it. <laughs> no, no, it's good. But see, see, for me, the, like, the ideal investor is somebody that is because one of my really good investors are now is somebody, somebody that's been. I was actually going to do this in a case study. Somebody that's been watching me for a while. He contacted me. We had a Zoom call. He's he, he's over in Ireland. He's got a bit of money there. He's he's got a couple of properties that he's refinancing as well. He's going to pull out quite a, a quite a lump of money as well. And he just says, "Listen, I really like your business model. I like how you've got a full end to end system, um, and I want to you know buy some deals." So come off the call. He's then bought a deal office. I then started my new bespoke plan, uh, which is a monthly subscription, and you work a lot closer one to one with him. And he jumped on that as well, and it was like. He was already on the VIP, and I, you know he's like, no, no, I want to work close. So, like, I'm going to buy a lot of properties here. Now right. this guy is, you walk by him in the street, you would not, you know, you would not think this is not a suit guy. This is nothing. Yeah. This is just the somebody ones, that's got a good I, a job in IT, managed to build quite a bit of money up. Probably his friends and family are, are, are none the wiser, and he's just been watching myself and whoever else and he's just like do you know something I'm going to go on I'm going to start building a portfolio because I want to get three grand a month cash flow by the end of the year type thing and this is that that's just a a guy and obviously a good job that's managed to build some sort of um, capital to start investing and he's investing it yeah. you know so it's what, what, what about you so I think it's a very simple equation, isn't it? So like I said, people know property is a good thing that they should be doing if they've got money there, but they just don't have the time, they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the skills, they can't be bothered, whatever it may be. Maybe they're a bit nervous, so they need to work with people like us who solve that problem for them. So someone, you know, typical clients, you know, they've maybe got a high-paying job, um, which keeps them very busy. They've got other businesses, which, you know, they're making good profits in. Um, also people that are not obviously from the area we're from that need to use us. So yep. you know, we've both got a lot of clients from London and stuff like that. Overseas we've already touched on, but the simple fact of it is is they either don't have the time or the experience to, to find good quality property deals and manage the process themselves. Mm -hmm. That's just summarised it, isn't it? Yeah. And people that, you know, are not looking for these crazy all money out deals. I mean, I've sold a few all money out deals. I mean, I've got one in Hoyk at the moment, that two to three bed, the client will leave about £1,800 in it. So it's like all money out in eight months. The same client, we, the first deal I got him, he got all money out plus £1,500, including his buildings insurance and all that for the year. So he got paid 1500 quid to buy that property. Yeah. And then there's other ones where he'll maybe leave, um, I don't know, twenty five grand in, but balance it out over the portfolio. It makes complete sense. But and I, the biggest thing for me now, and I've not had to look for new clients for probably a year. I've got 5,000 names on the mailing list, as I said, but hardly send them an email because it's just to just all go to my direct buyers. But the biggest thing for me is I want to be working with sound people. Yeah. And it's like me and you and our, our relationship, mate, is we got on really well and that's the same with all my other clients. And the biggest thing for me is I want to work with people that that probably only want to work with me. I think the, the big mistake that a lot of investors make and when they're trying to break into properties there's no loyalty and, and they want to work with all these different sourcers and buy a deal off him or do this and do that to me that quite annoys me yeah, yeah. not all the time and I, I obviously quite like it working with you in terms of we've got quite a few shared investors but if they want to work with everybody and anybody it's not for me because yeah. the people that are going to get the best quality deals off us are probably the people we like the best and the people that are good repeat customers yeah. loyalty is a, is a big thing for me yeah do you know something I totally agree and that's one of the reasons why I decided to go down the route that I go down for, for anyone that doesn't know as I say I've got my free mailing list and then I've got my VIP now they pay £50 a month to see the deals first they get that back in their sourcing fee if they take a deal and there's some other perks in there but I, I, th that's why I started that mate because I still want to do things to scale I yeah. want to still have loads of investors yeah. but I it's a case of you're in you're in one of the plans basically. Yeah. That's how you work with us. It's not like 
you know, oh, phoning me up, oh, I've got, yeah, I'm looking for a fight, it's going to help me out and stuff, no, I just join one of my plans type yeah. thing, and that's the thing, there is no loyalty with a lot of these investors, they yeah. do want to work with people down south, people f- f- all over Scotland, and totally. you do have the, the other sourcers, you know, jumping down their throat and trying to get £1,500 a month off them and stuff like that. Totally, man. And that, that's the thing, that the way that I've built my business is just working with good people, yeah. and I'm really, really lucky to do that. I've probably maybe got space to onboard one more person, but that would be it and I've, I just don't look for them because all the good deals just go to the people that I like I've yeah. worked with before they're easy to deal with they always pay on time they're happy with the fees as long as it's built into exactly. the deal so the vast majority of my deals are all direct deals with my clients it'll be my deal and my buyer and then I've got full control over the process I'll manage the refurb send them weekly check-in videos and um, we'll go over this in the case studies but it works two ways if people yeah. have got other businesses in that or you know there's People end up doing you a lot of favours and stuff like that on the back of the business you do with them. It's brilliant. Yeah. So, so uh, it's kind of like touching on because we've got a point there about like sort of dealing with these investors. But yeah. you've, you've kind of started that um, that answer anyway. So, I, I guess like really for me, y- your reputation is still absolutely everything when you're working with these investors. And one of the things that you still see to this day, and maybe it's like maybe it's meant on purpose or maybe they're just inexperienced but the numbers just not stacking or some of the numbers being hidden or some of the, the photos you know one one at a major of a room where you could only see maybe two or three walls what, what, what about the other end of the room just small things like that um, for me disclosing everything to the investors is absolute paramount 100% um, I, I think it's that's one way you're going to keep your reputation. See, for me, I say to Alex and the team all the time, I just go, we aren't really trying to sell this deal. Yeah. We are just trying to, pre- we are, we are just presenting this deal. 100%. Let them make their decision. Yeah. Now, obviously, we'll guide them and we will, you know, if they've got a couple of questions or certain ways we can answer and stuff like that. But by no means have I ever threw a deal down an investor's floor yeah. to say yeah. you must buy hard this. Sell. The hard sell. Mate, That's exactly. it. And, and, and I'm big on that as well. Quite often with my one to one clients, um, I know what they're looking for. I know their goals. I know their situation. I know how their life's made up. I know what's right for them. And I will never put them in a deal that's not right for them so yeah. quite often I'll maybe send a deal out on my mailing list and one of my kind of one-to-one clients will message me and say oh how have you never sent me that and I'll just categorically say to them look it's, it's not right for you because mm-hmm. it's maybe not the right area or the cash flow is not the best or I know I can find them something better and when you do that and you turn business away from people they've got full trust in me yeah. and I've got full trust in them and it's a two-way street and that is how you build successful long-term relationships with investors. And that means when you get a deal in for me, and I say this all the time, when I get a good deal in, that one in Gore Bridge that I sold, that came from someone else in my network. It was his house, one of the guys I was talking about before. I viewed that. I sent my client a video. I said, this is what it is. This is the numbers on it. Do you want to go for it? And within an hour of viewing it, the tenant was still in it. He said, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. And it's literally that simple. If, you, if you're just honest, transparent, credible, and you don't fuck anybody over, yeah. Um, that's it's one of the biggest ways to retain your investors 100%. is not selling them a deal. That's what yeah. I've found, and it's it's sometimes you think you know am I being daft here? You know the deal is actually a decent deal or, or whatever, yeah. but it's maybe just not right for them. Totally. And see if you can just explain that to them. Listen, I've got there'll be another one round the corner, but this one I just don't think you should go for it. Yeah, yeah. Jesus man, they, they, they just they take to you so the, much. The client that bought this one, he inquired about one on my mailing list in Pilton in Edinburgh. And again, I know him, I know what his situation, I know what his goals. He says, look, I don't think this is right for you. And yeah, he's like, okay, yeah. thanks very much for telling me that. Especially someone that's based thousands and thousands of miles away. If you can just make sure you don't put them in something that's not right for them, mm. that's how you build lasting relationships, yeah, isn't it? Totally agree, mate. Um, anything else on that then? Jump onto the case yeah, study? I, I, I think communication is just the biggest thing for me. And that goes across the board in anything you do. Like You hear it all the time, like, oh, I can't get hold of such and such. And that my clients and pretty much anyone, to be honest, that's got my number, can get a hold of me as long as I'm not asleep. Like yeah. 24-7, I'm available. If someone pings me, I'll reply within a minute, especially my good investors and stuff like that. Because if they're messaging you, they probably need something or they've got a question or they need help with something or this or that. Um, and you just need to get back to them. Do you mean it's simple? But a lot of people don't have that courtesy. Yeah. And the only other thing I would say is, like you said, make sure you're careful with the refurb numbers. Mm-hmm. Things always go wrong in property, don't they? They always go wrong. There's always things that normally come out or whatever in most deals. But just make sure you're giving plenty of buffer on the refurb. Don't get ahead of yourself in terms of the end value. Mm-hmm. Call a surveyor. Call 
local agents to confirm that end value because we should be pulling data from all different kind of data sources. It's not just what we no, think. 100%. We need to be you know, speaking to professionals and, and getting letting agents advice on rentals in the area on the do, street if you don't know it. Do, do you know something? It's mad the amount of sources that still don't go that extra know, mile. And like it's you so just simple. look on right move and they go, oh, there's a comparable that same value. Aye, one. But you, you need to be doing more than this. It happens within the network as well. I've seen that. I get sent deals all the time and nobody's spoke to an agent. They've yeah. no, definitely not spoke to a surveyor. They've maybe looked on right move. They've maybe looked at one rental comparable. Maybe not even looked at open rent. Like using all these portfolio, uh, all these portals. Sorry, yeah. sorry. Um, checking old home reports on one survey. There, there's so much more you can do. I think the biggest one is just phoning local agents as well. They're the people Aye. in the know. I wouldn't phone one of them. I'd phone two or three, and I would get an overall, a, 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 a more of a rounded and, and opinion just of them. Conservative. But I think, especially with how hot the market's been the last couple of years, if you look at comparables, by the way, comparables have got to be dated in the last three months. Yeah. If you're doing a mortgage appeal for a, a revaluation, it's got to be dated. If it's over three months, they don't I know. care. I know. I know. So like, there's no point pulling a, a, a thing for November 22 because it's totally yeah. irrelevant now, yeah. especially because things go crazy over home report and you don't know. Um, yeah, that, that's funny you, you mentioned that because see these ones that you look at on like the buying section of right move just to see what's there the now what's yeah. sold you know, you click the sold box yeah. they, they're not taking any consideration either because they're not completed yeah. yet so yeah. they, they are essentially they, totally. you can throw them out listen you can use that as a guide of course but like you say they have to be very 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 recent uh, the comparables that we're, we're sort of looking at the, the rest the other ones you look back on maybe a year's time six months time or whatever that's all you want to be getting multiple of them to try and build a picture, not just one. Yeah. You know? And like you say, the market is changing because the COVID aftermath when the prices were going crazy and everything was inflated, that has gradually come down and down and down this yeah. year. Not towards a crash or anything, but it's settling back down. But people are still looking at these prices back then I know. And, try, and doing comparables, which you need to be careful with. Doesn't it work, but... I think that kind of summarises dealing with investors then. Um, do you want to hit us with a couple of case studies? How yeah. you found a certain investor, etc.? Yeah, so I, I kind of touched on one of my good investors now who's bought, he's on property number five, waiting for a refinance. So basically he's bought four, refinancing two or f uh, three of them at the minute. Then he's got another refinance over in Ireland. So... The, the idea is get the money back in and he's going to go for another five. He wants to do it, well, another six. He's going to go for ten before the end of the year, hopefully. Um, and literally, like, out of nowhere, this guy gave me a bit of a wake-up call just in terms of the way I am with a lot of investors. So many people want to jump in a call with you. Yeah. And most nine times out of ten, they're, they're kind of time wasters. Or maybe, you know, they've gone by one deal or whatever. But these sort of investors is the sort of investors that, I want, and yeah. you you do want, ideally, they want to buy a number of properties off you, not just one, you work with a lot closer with them, and when I got that a message from him, and I jumped, jumped on a call with him, it was all very much, you know, right, there's another Zoom call with an investor that may, may or may not do something. You seem pretty just, negative about your investors, mate. No, you know, it's, not, it's not that I'm negative about the investors, mate, it's just that it's... You just don't believe I've anything? Ha I've Aye. just had, I've had it too many times where investors come on and they, 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 they kind of promise you the world. They promise themselves the world they're going to do this, this and this. Yeah. And I'm like, listen, I will help you. I can help you. I know the deals you want. Like, this is what we do. This is our bread and butter and you never hear from them again. Yeah. So that's that's just what I'm not meaning to be negative in, in terms of the investors. It's just when I get on these calls now, I'm probably a wee bit more, yeah, yeah, I'm not as excitable and it's just like, this is what I can do, this is how I can help you, it's up to you. Now when he came on, that was the sort of same approach and like I said, um, he came on to my VIP, bought a deal and now I'm working with him one to one and he's on deal number five. So it just, the biggest takeaway that I've got from this investor and which was like a major sort of patting it back to myself type thing was, I've worked like fuck over the last couple of years to do the sourcing and people thought I was mad then doing the lettings and then obviously I've got my own developments going on. Then it's the network and then <laughs> now eventually the home improvements is in its own entity. But that was all for a reason. Do you know what I mean? It was all like so that I've got two business partners in the lettings. I've got Sean running the home improvements. I do the sourcing but I've got staff members and then obviously me and you do the networking. So yeah. it's like as much as there's a lot going on, it's all kind of relevant to what I wanted to achieve in this full end to end model. And he says that he came with me because I had that end to end. But he says that's exactly what I was looking for. So I was like, ah, 
I do. <laughs> we, we speak about this all the time, though. Like people always say, like, "Oh, you're spreading yourself too thin and all yeah. that." But I don't know what other people that just do one thing fucking no. do all day. See, see, the, see the, the thing is as well. I get kind of fixated in the early days of multiple streams of income because in property, shit happens, COVID yeah. happens, and, and stuff happens, and you're nothing. Like, how many people do you know that when COVID hit, they were out of job, they had no income coming in? And I was like, ah, oh, fuck, I, I, I never want that to be me, you know, and I, I was I was in the offshore for months and stuff like that, I had the income coming in, so I was kind of fixated on that, but it's, uh, I think there's, in property, there's, you can't just do one thing, no. especially if you're doing sourcing, if you're sourcing, the, the, the number one thing you should be doing is sourcing for yourself, so if you source for yourself, there you go, there you're flipping, you're a developer now as well, yeah. and an investor, so that's two things right away, yeah. and then you maybe, you know, you get a good opportunity to buy a bite of let, then you go, you're a landlord now, and so it's like, then you it just kind of grows. You're a landlord, you sell your own flat for a estate agent, you know what I mean, before you know it. It grows arms and legs, man, and it's just opportunities. It's good fun, though. It's good fun. But no, I've got a good, a good case study, so I was in the market for my first Range Rover, mm -hmm. this is, uh, I don't know, how long ago, a couple of years ago or whatever. Um, and I, I don't know if it was a couple of years ago, it must have been about a couple of years ago time I got that car. So I was on LinkedIn one day and I seen that somebody worked at a Land Rover garage and I was like, oh, I'm gonna shoot him a message to see what kind of price I can get on a, the car that I'm looking for. Shot him a message, he helped me out with a quote and all that. Ended up not coming to anything. And then he said at the end, oh, by the way, I'm maybe thinking about looking to invest in property. Again, just going through my LinkedIn, seen it's all set up properly and everything like my old LinkedIn and yeah. uh, ended up hitting it off. He's just completed on his fifth property with me um, just on Friday there and then he's done some really amazing things for me in terms of his line of work and that as well. He's got me a new car, this is my second Range Rover and uh, he's helped me out with so much stuff, a really, really good guy. Um, and then I've got another client that's um, got a big gas business. He's like a, a really good friend of mine now, which is phenomenal. Again, he's probably bought six or seven and um, I guess goes kind of networking just one more as I was invited to the fourth awards with McEwen Fraser mm -hmm. in December there. Um, I was flying to Dubai the next day, which was a bit of experience. It was quite a messy one. I think it starts at like quarter to 12 in the day or something. Oh, really? But I was sat next to a, a, a guy who used to do a lot of restaurants in Edinburgh. He's quite well known in the Edinburgh kind of business space. And was sat next to him at the table at the fourth awards and he's ended up buying a, a property off me and Gorgie. So, so just, it, yeah, you go, it's a, it's a networking it thing is, in different environments. We were it? just chatting back and forth. Yeah. He's uh, He doesn't drink. So he was just sitting there having a cappuccino and I was knocking back the pints at the fourth awards. <laughs> So he was probably he's getting the confidence. But do you know what's really interesting is he 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 reckons that was fate us sitting next to each yeah. other. But what he said, which was really interesting, is I obviously took his phone number down and all that at the event, and he says, you know, you're one of the first people that's ever spoke to me at something like that, and then actually said, followed up and done what you say you were going to do. So I said, look, I'm away to Dubai. I'll text you when I get back. Came back from Dubai in my calendar, text him, and he said, most people go to stuff like that, and you just never hear from them again. You yeah, never follow yeah, yeah. up, and then subsequently we went on to do to do a deal. So mm -hmm. it just it just goes to show you, doesn't it? Investors yeah. are everywhere, online, offline, yep. speaking to people. Um, so, and that's it. That's good. It's good. Um, I feel like it's been quite a long one. So we've got some questions to finish in, Cameron. Uh, it's funny, as you guys were speaking, I was like, kind of just taking the math because she's just talking. Oh, really? really? <laughs> just so much value, mate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I've got a few here. Um, so first question. What information do investors typically want to see in our property sourcing proposal? How should you ideally present yourself? Aye, brilliant. So, so David's got a big fancy glossy pack that he sends them, which takes about six months to get through. <laughs> but um, first of all, they want to see that you're credible, which is just before they see the pack. They want to see what your case study is. I used to go out and meet clients with deals that I've done. Um, just with the numbers and stuff, used to give it to them while we're having coffee and whatnot. Um, I don't really do that so much anymore, but they want to see you're credible, they want to see that you're compliant most of the time, um, just have your compliance in order. Did they, they never ask me? This, this is a good thing to say, mate. Oh, right, okay, yeah, just have compliance, eh? um, Yeah, it's compliance, and, <laughs> um, and then, you know, a deal pack, mine's just literally a one page, or sometimes it's two page, it's got a link to the photos, the EPC, the home report, if there is one, a walkthrough video, loads of photos of every room, the current market value, what price you've got to secure that, what the ADS and the legal fees are going to be, what the refurb estimate's going to be with a breakdown further into the document, what your fees are, what the 
total investment cost is, what it's going to rent for, what it's going to be worth done up. Probably, I normally put the gross yield in it, even though it doesn't really mean anything. Yeah. How much money they're going to leave in the deal if they refinance or you know whatever the exit strategy is. I'll do a blurb about the property, about the seller situation, why they're selling, um, and any other helpful documents and anything relating to that property as such. And mine's is just literally a one or two page Word document with a bit of branding on it. Convert that to a PDF and then send it along with a link to the Google Drive, which has got all the documents, and that's it. That's it. I think like we do do a, quite a fancy PDF, and it's all interactive and clickable and stuff like that. That's again just part of the kind of modern strategy that we we take. But like you say, like, I I used for so long just an email, and it was an email template on Word, transferred to email, sent to all the investors, and it was just the high level details, the numbers, the condition. Why are they selling? estate and agent info, so we'd always, we'd always make an effort to at least phone one of them, they could just sign get and get and and get and get and and get and get and get and 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 do you get a word of that, mate? So, so basically, to make sure the deal's profitable for them? I found it so far. That's a challenge. The thing with that is, it's, it's going to be profitable for you if the deal's good enough, because you need an investor to buy the deal. So a deal has to be a deal, there has to be some sort of deal in it. Whether it actually was under ADS, or it's really high yield, or it's a PRR, or it's a flip, or an SE, or something. There has to be an exit for that deal, otherwise you're not getting paid for the deal, really. You know, so the, 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 it's all about the deal, the strength of the deal, the, the better the deal, the higher you can charge as well. You know, some deals are going for four or five, five grand now if they're really, really good um, numbers. You may get talking about one year under two years and stuff like that, which is still a, a phenomenal deal now. So if you're just talking a box standard deal, then you're, you're just box standard fees, which is, you know, your PK, which is obviously not going to be that much. So I think for me it's... Um the normal metrics we normally work off is like 15 grand left in on refinance yeah, yeah. and then kind of 250 net cash flow. Yeah, that's what it's happening. That's it's like six months ago, it was sitting at 20 grand. You know what I mean? So that's um, And then as David says, for me, it's that the discount is everything which I say every single fucking day in my life. But <laughs> if you secure a deal at, at 20, I mean, I, I made 22 grand off a of source deal last year, just from one deal to a client. And that's because that was secured at like 50% off. Do you know what I mean? So uh, the bigger discount you get on it, the more money you're making. It's a bit tight, you'll make free. If it's the best deal in the world, you can make a complete fortune. Yeah. But it's all about getting yeah. this client. It's funny because look, this, like, you can make 10 grand plus in sourcing and it used to kind of, people used to laugh at it and you don't realise that it's so, so possible mm -hmm. if the deal is strong enough for you. Yeah. One more. more. Yeah. Last question. What legal documents and agreements are necessary when bringing on investors for a property deal? So the, the right answer is you probably want a terms of business, terms and conditions, all signed with identifying their criteria. You definitely need to do the AML checks. That's yeah. a, a big thing. That's a non-negotiable. Yeah. But me and my business, I don't get them to sign anything. When someone comes on board to work with me, we've already identified their criteria. Um, I just take a £250 deposit off them, which is nothing. There's no barrier to entry at all. And then that comes off the balance of the first sourcing fee. I probably am going to change that and just charge a one-off fee for new people coming on board just because the demand's there. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of documentation, I don't do anything. There's absolutely nothing except for the email check. For me, it's just about our uh, criteria. If they sign up to our basic mailing list, well, there's 13,500 people on it now, they get a welcome email. If they sign up to a VIP, they'll be prompted to fill in that criteria, which we then get recorded and we'll book a call with them. We'll invite them in and make them feel a welcome and special and uh, it's just us getting to work really but the AML stuff is yeah you, that, that is non-negotiable a lot of sources will get their AML set up and not actually practice it as such you yeah. need to be doing it when they're buying which is maybe a lot of people but yeah so just before we finish up I just wanted to, to, to thank all of our new members in yeah. property sourcing yeah. member community so we've had 16 new sign ups this month mm -hmm. um, which is massive again it just goes to testament of how strong the group is at the moment everybody's been buzzing the chat's been going 162 or something so maybe 163 yeah. I think when I looked this morning so 163 people in the group is amazing so so many deals and that being done as well which is great to see mm -hmm. so just wanted to say thank you to all of our new and obviously all of our 
our existing members. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we've got a new one-to-one client in the main town as well. Yeah. This month signed up to start in a month's time or something. Right. So, so July, which should be good. So thanks for listening, everybody, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you.